Hi guys, it's me, Chazzer HD, and welcome to my fifth episode of the podcast, where today we are going to be reviewing the 2024 Formula One season so far. Of course, the final race before the summer break was just a few days ago at Spa, a race that turned into something quite dramatic, not just at the end of the race, but also post-race as well. But the last few races before the summer break really spiced up 2024. Um, Not just, you know, the improvement of just the entertainment of the races, but most importantly, the competitiveness of Formula 1 in 2024. That is really why the season has picked up, because the first seven, eight races of the year, let's be honest, were quite boring. Even... You know, when we got to the very beginning of the European season, the races were still very boring and we didn't really get any uh, proper action in the races. But I'd say probably since the Canadian Grand Prix up until um, now, it's been, yeah, much, much better. And we've had overall, I would say uh, um, uh, probably a six to seven out of ten season so far in terms of entertainment. Um, But... In this mid-season review, we're not necessarily going to be covering, um, you know, just how good of a season it's been so far, how fun it's been. We will get into that. I will obviously be getting into the best races of the season so far. But the three main things we are getting into in this mid-season review is firstly, a review of the teams and how they've all performed this season. Then, secondly, we are going to get into the best races of the season. I do have a list of five races written down, and we'll go through uh, which one was the best all the way through to the, you know, the worst out of those five. Obviously, you guys can let me know what, you know, the top five best races of the year have been for you in the comments section. And then, finally, we'll go through, I think, probably what is most anticipated is my driver rankings for 2024 so far, where we will be going from 21st all the way to 1st. Obviously, 21 drivers have competed in 2024, including, obviously, Oliver Behrman, who did a race for Ferrari in Saudi Arabia. So, we will be ranking every single driver that has competed in 2024. But we will start, like I said, with the team performances. And we're going to go from top to bottom with the teams. And we'll start, of course, with Red Bull Racing. Now, in the first seven to eight races, I think Red Bull did the best they could, really, uh, with the type of car they had. They did fail to win the Australian Grand Prix, which obviously um, was down to a reliability issue for Max Verstappen. I do believe if he had finished the race, he would have won that race. I don't think Ferrari at that point were genuinely quick enough to beat Red Bull. Um, But then all the races surrounding that, obviously Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Shanghai, Suzuka, Red Bull. They didn't just win, they absolutely dominated those race weekends. There was the race in Miami, of course, where Lando Norris was able to take his first uh, Formula 1 victory and McLaren took their first victory. But there was a bit of luck on Lando's side to be able to get that. Max's car was also damaged and he still ended up finishing a second. Verstappen then, of course, picked up a win at Imola. Monaco, they ended up off the podium for the first time um, or for the second time in 2024. But after that, Monaco Grand Prix, things have been quite different for Red Bull. It's been much harder for the Red Bull team since that Canadian Grand Prix. And the reason that it's been that way is because right around that time of the Canadian Grand Prix, Red Bull's car, as they were trying to, um, you know, upgrade it and obviously improve on the car, ended up according to Max Verstappen, making the car, the handling, worse than it was before. And that coincided at the same time as Mercedes and also McLaren, who a couple of races ago had brought a big upgrade, getting better. And that is really what has caused Red Bull from that Canadian Grand Prix on to now to have such trouble at winning races. Because since the Canadian Grand Prix... 
they have only won one race up until now, which of course was at the Spanish Grand Prix. Brilliant drive from Max Verstappen to win that Grand Prix and crucial for his world championship bid. Um, but that's really what has caused Red Bull's form to drop off. They have failed to improve on the car and the speed of the car, but have also made the handling worse. We've seen at certain races Max having you know a lot of understeer with the car, complaining about the balance of the car a lot more than we're used to. And um, yeah, the improvement from other teams, McLaren and Mercedes, as I think really um, maximised, no pun intended, their pain in these last few races. But they have still, with Max Verstappen at least, uh, still been able to grab vital points for the Drivers' Championship bid. Um, even though McLaren have had, I would say, most of the time since the Canadian Grand Prix a faster car than Red Bull have had. Max has still been able to finish ahead of Lando Norris um, and beat him in, you know, can uh, Canada, Spain. Obviously, Austria was, you know, a, a bit different because the two drivers collided. Lando retired, Max did not. But obviously, we had Silverstone, where McLaren were definitely quicker than Red Bull. But McLaren obviously got it wrong strategically, which is what allowed Max to, uh, you know, take that position, that second place in the end of that Grand Prix. And then, of course, Spa, the last race before the summer break, uh, McLaren with Lando having a poor race and Verstappen taking advantage of that. And that's why Max still has a pretty comfortable driver's championship lead because Lando Norris, who, of course, we'll get on to later, has not quite taken full advantage of Max Verstappen and Red Bull having these issues as of late. But on the Constructors' Championship side, Red Bull definitely are in danger. They are currently, I think, about 42 points clear of uh, McLaren in the um, in the Constructors' Championship. Obviously, later on in this uh, podcast, I will make sure to throw up on screen the Driver and Constructor Championship standings so you can see what it is. Um, but yeah... You know, despite winning way more races than McLaren, remember McLaren have only won two races this year. Red Bull have won how many? Um, it's like six or seven race wins Red Bull have had this year. Despite that, the gap is only yeah forty two points, and that is because Sergio Perez and the second Red Bull, after what was a good start to the season, ever since really the what Miami Grand Prix. Um, or the race at Imola around that time in May has shown absolutely zero speed or skill and has been absolutely terrible and remarkably has kept his seat for the rest of the year. There are some conspiracy theories that it might be to do with um, ticket sales for the Mexican uh, Grand Prix later this year and that maybe uh, billionaire Carlos Slim has stepped in to, to help Perez there. I don't know what the truth are with those claims, but I am amazed that Sergio Perez is staying at Red Bull, because he is the reason Red Bull don't have as comfortable a lead in the Constructors' Championship as they do in the Drivers' Championship. He has been pathetic in 2024. So, for Red Bull, obviously at the moment, struggling with their car. Their car not as good as it uh, obviously once was earlier this season. I don't think the car, though, is as bad as people, um, you know, have made out. Um, obviously, we have to remember, you know, with Spa, obviously Max only ended up finishing fourth, but did have a grid penalty, was brilliant in qualifying uh, at Spa in the wet. If we look back to Silverstone, where, yeah, Red Bull didn't have a great event, you know, Max put in an amazing qualifying lap, qualifying, I think, was it fourth on the grid with a car that was, you know, quite damaged on the floor and a car that, without that damage, could very well have been on pole position for that Grand Prix event. Um, so, you know, when you put those things into context, Red Bull, they still have a fast car, it just isn't anywhere near as quick as it was at the start of the season. They are 
I would say at least level on pace with McLaren right now. Um, obviously with Mercedes, you know, the comparison of pace between them, it's it's difficult to say. It really depends on you know what track we're at and also you know um, you know what the weather conditions are, how hot it is, stuff like that. Um, but I think in general, Red Bull's car is still good enough to win races, you know, going forward for the rest of the 2024 season. Um, but I think Red Bull, so far with what they've done in the first 14 races, I would probably give them, um, you know, if I was to give them a grade, I'd probably give them a, I don't know, a, a solid B, maybe a B minus or something like that for the season so far. Um, I think most of the time, I think they've done, as a team, the best they could have done. I do think, again, a lot of their issues are to do with one driver, Sergio Perez, who, you know, just isn't performing. And there's nothing really uh, the team can do about that unless, of course, they get rid of him, which is not what they're doing for some reason. Um, yeah, I think Red Bull in general, most of the time, have done the best they can. Just need to focus when they come back from the summer break in being a bit more consistent with their results because they've only been on the podium, uh, what, once in the last four races and they can't afford that form to continue because things uh, things could really get hairy in not just the constructors but drivers' championship. But in general, still a good season so far for Red Bull. On the drivers' side, I still think they will win the world championship. On the constructors' side, though, I... I don't believe they will. I, I I think with them keeping Perez in the car, I think that is going to cost them the Constructors' Championship the, to, to the team that we will now go on to in McLaren. What a season they have had. Um, continuing off of the great form of you know the second half of last season. Started the season probably not as strongly as we were hoping. Uh, McLaren did say, though, coming into the season that they thought... Um, you know, that they would get a lot better once we got into the European season and that they knew there was a lot more to come. But still, again, it was a kind of a bit disappointing how they started the season. They weren't quite uh, anywhere near, of course, Red Bull, but they also weren't really as quick as Ferrari either, who were definitely the second best team in that first, say, five races of the year. But then we got to the Miami Grand Prix. They brought a significant upgrade to their car. And that, right there, is where their season transformed. Lando Norris, of course, took his first victory in Miami. A victory that, again, as I said earlier, it was a lucky victory. The safety car did help him a lot. I don't think he would have won the race had it not been for that safety car. I think he would have ended up probably on the podium at best, but... Like I said, I don't think he would have won the race. But it was clear to see from certain moments in that race that the pace from the McLaren was much stronger than it was before and that McLaren were now here to play in 2024. And really, since that Grand Prix, at every Grand Prix since then, McLaren have regularly been competing for pole position and the race victory. And... At certain races, I think you could say, you know, they tried, but they just weren't good enough. And they just, you know, weren't as good as whoever else, team or driver. For example, Imola. I think Max Verstappen and Red Bull just did a better job. Same with Monaco. Leclerc and Ferrari just did a better job. That's why they ended up getting pole and winning that event. But I think you could definitely say, since the Canadian Grand Prix up until now... Even though they've won two races this year, being in Miami and Hungary, you could definitely argue they should have two, maybe three more race wins in 2024. And that is really the thing to think about if you are McLaren going into the summer break. Is yeah, we've had a good season. You know, the the the, the bid for the constructors' championship looks good, but. We could do better. We could still do quite a bit better in terms of maximising race results. In Canada, 
probably less so. I think you could say that they could have won that race, but I mean, it was uh, was still possible. Um, you know, strategically, you know, when they moved from, I think, was it Inters to uh, dry tyres, maybe they could have been a lap or two quicker with that to ensure that Lando didn't lose as much time to Max <laughs> as he ended up doing by going uh, a bit longer with that particular stint. Again, you know, we can argue and debate over that, whether, you know, um, if, if if McLaren had done something different, maybe he would have won the race, who knows. Obviously, in Spain, McLaren were on pole with Norris, Lando got a poor start, overtook by two cars, and really that's what cost him the chance to be able to win the Spanish Grand Prix. In Austria, Lando had multiple chances to overtake Max on track before the crash, didn't take those chances, and then the crash happened, and everything else after that, you know, all the controversy. Silverstone, McLaren, both in qualifying and the race, did not execute um, and did not deliver the best result they could have. And really, that's why that whole weekend was just such a disappointment from McLaren. Hungary, of course, won two in qualifying in the race. Brilliant result for them. Even though they got that result, though, there was still controversy that could easily have been avoided by the McLaren team. And then at Spa, still believe that if they had gone for a uh, one-stop strategy with Piastri, I still think that maybe they could have ended up taking victory. Now, of course, George Russell got disqualified doing his one-stop strategy. Maybe McLaren thought they would be a bit tight on weight if they had gone for the one-stopper. Maybe that's what was behind their thinking. I'm not sure exactly, but... I still think, strategically, McLaren could have done something different. And, again, that is the most important thing for McLaren to think of going into this summer break is, yeah, we've had a great season, but there are still a lot more points on offer than, you know, they've been able to take so far. Because, you know, if this, um, this rate of not quite taking their chances in the races and not maybe winning, you know, certain races that they should win. If that trend continues, then maybe they won't win the Constructors' Championship. I mean, we don't know how the second half of the season is going to go. Maybe Red Bull will magically find, um, you know, a ton of performance through a new upgrade and be able to stretch the gap back out to half a second between them and McLaren you don't know at the end of the day when you have the chance to win races you you've got to take those uh take you know take those chances and McLaren like I said in the second half of the season you don't know how many more chances they might have to win races and then you've got obviously Mercedes in there Ferrari might magically improve so that is the one thing they need to focus on delivering on in the second half of the year, is delivering the race result that they should deliver and that they have the pace for. Because too many times in the last few weeks, they have looked good enough to win and not won. And you can't be a team that is like that because you're always going to end up with way less success as a team if you are regularly not delivering as good of a result um, on a regular basis as uh, uh, you know as you could get, so yeah, we'll see how it goes for McLaren. I personally think they will win the constructors' championship because the pace of the car is very good. The two drivers are performing very well uh, at the moment, and of course, are a better driver lineup than what Red Bull have got. And I think they will pull away from uh, Ferrari and Mercedes behind in the constructors. So, yeah, if they can win the Constructors' Championship, then that would be a great season. But nothing's guaranteed in Formula 1. Even though Red Bull have decided to keep Perez, that does not necessarily mean that Red Bull are guaranteed to lose the Constructors' Championship. So we will see with McLaren how things uh, play out. Um, let's next go on to third place in the Championship, Ferrari. And... I mean, to be honest, there's not really much to say with Ferrari uh, compared to what we've already said, um, you know, in the past few weeks and months. Start of the season very quick. They were the best team out, you know, behind Red Bull. 
Uh, they obviously won in Australia. They were regularly on the podium. Won the Monaco Grand Prix. Looked incredible in Monaco. And two weeks later in Canada, they were absolutely nowhere. And since then, they have been, again, absolutely nowhere. But the problems that, you know, we saw after the Monaco Grand Prix had actually, um, I guess, spawned for Ferrari before the Monaco Grand Prix, where they'd brought an upgrade at Imola that they were hoping would give them an extra two to three tenths of a second, and it didn't really deliver the improvement they were hoping for. Then they brought another upgrade about a month later to the Spanish Grand Prix, which again, they were hoping would give them improvement, and... It hasn't. And that's why Ferrari have gone from, you know, regular podium team, winning a couple races to now. I mean, they obviously were on were on the podium at Spa, but before then they were struggling to get even near a podium um in Formula One. And they were on quite a disastrous run, were the Ferrari team. They weren't really able on pace to fight Mercedes, McLaren or Red Bull. Have, though, in the last couple races found um, a bit more pace, it, it appears, with their um, with their race pace, which is good to see. They did bring, I think, an upgrade in Hungary to their floor, which may be responsible for that. And if that is the case, that's great. But it feels a, too little, too late, really, from the Scuderia, because that car... That Ferrari car, fundamentally, it's a good car. They just haven't really improved, you know, the car since the, the, the start of the season. And that's why McLaren and Mercedes have overtaken them and are able to, you know, regularly fight for race wins. And Ferrari, the best they could hope for, you know, is a podium or, you know, fourth place in a Grand Prix. Um, Yeah, Ferrari... Just very disappointing. Very, very disappointing. Because after that Monaco Grand Prix win, honestly, I thought I, I thought they could probably, you know, if they could just improve by that two or three tenths of a second to, you know, get up to Red Bull's level, I thought they could start fighting for the championship. And Leclerc, you know, uh, I think after that Monaco win was only it was like 40 points behind in the championship. I thought... You know, this is the time to launch that championship bid. And then, yeah, after Monaco, it's been, you know, a disaster run, really, for um, the team. Uh, but, like I said, things have improved in the last couple races, which is good to see. But they've got issues there, which I don't think can be fixed before the end of the season. Unless they magically bring an upgrade that, you know, gives them an extra half a second per lap, which would be amazing if that happens. Unless that happens, I don't think Ferrari's season is really going to be any different in the second half of the season compared to how it's been as of late. Um, certain races, they'll be able probably to nick a podium, but most races, in terms of who the race win will be contested, um, with it will be McLaren, Red Bull, with Verstappen, of course, and Mercedes Benz. Ferrari, like I said, they're going to be um, on the outside looking in. Occasionally will be on the podium, but race wins are just not there for them at the moment. They haven't got the pace, unfortunately, to get that. Um, and maybe that is, you could say, part of this, um, you know. The Monaco curse, I guess you could say, in a way, where obviously you know Leclerc had a curse at Monaco, finally broke it by winning the Monaco Grand Prix, and maybe you know getting that win has uh, meant that he now must <laughs> and the team must now suffer for the for the rest of the year. I don't know, but it's just so disappointing that they've dropped off like this because again, first few races of the year. That car was, was, it was strong. It was strong. It was fundamentally a good, quick, balanced car. But it just hasn't um, continued evolving. It just hasn't, you know, uh, kept up at the rate it needs to, to sustain a possible championship bid. And that's why they are 
where they are. Um, one good thing, though, for Ferrari is, of course, not only have they got a better driver lineup than Red Bull with Leclerc and Sainz, but they're still not that far behind Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship, and they are still gaining on Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship. Uh, I think the last couple races they have been, and are only, I think, is it 60 points behind? Or maybe just uh, uh, just over 70 points behind? And like I said, they've been gaining on Red Bull, I think, in three of the last four races. So it's not impossible that Ferrari could also get close to Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship as long as the two Ferrari drivers remain consistent and Red Bull also, um, you know, continue to fail to pick up race wins. So we'll keep our eyes on that. Um, But yeah, Ferrari, disappointing season uh, for them. It just really has unraveled poorly. And um, like I said, I don't think this is really this issue with the car. I, I think it's just a fundamental way with how the car is built and how the upgrades that are then fitted just don't mesh with the car. Um, I'll probably get into it maybe in a in a video later this year, probably after the season, um, in more detail as to why Ferrari's season has just unraveled um, and get into it from, a say, a technical perspective. But yeah, um, it, it, it's something that, they're not going to uh, figure out, I think, until next season, unfortunately. Mercedes-Benz, though, thankfully, their issues that they had in the first eight races of the season, they were able to figure out. And what a dramatic turnaround it has been for them. In the first eight races, they were horrendous. They were more of a midfield team on pace at times than they were a front-running team. They couldn't fight uh, McLaren, Ferrari, or Red Bull. They were just simply nowhere near the same pace as those teams. Um, You know, they were just fighting, really, to finish 6th and 7th or 7th and 8th, something like that. That's really what their, um, you know, the uh, maximum race result that they could get back then their car just simply wasn't up to snuff and we knew the reason why it was because aerodynamically through the uh, medium and especially high speed corners their car had zero grip in comparison to Ferrari, McLaren and Red Bull. Um, I remember I think around certain parts of the I think Saudi Arabian track earlier this year they were losing multiple tenths of a second to McLaren just in that first sector alone. It was ridiculous. But they brought a new front wing at the Canadian Grand Prix in Montreal and it has seemingly fixed all of their issues. Um, Well, maybe not all of their issues, but most of them. Because since then, they have been regularly contending for the podium, but not just that, but be uh, contending for race wins. The Canadian Grand Prix, you could argue they were unlucky not to, um, you know, maybe win that given how competitive they were. I do think the wet conditions didn't necessarily help their effort. I think if it was a dry race in Canada, that probably would have helped more to them possibly winning the Canadian Grand Prix. Um, Obviously, Silverstone was uh, a very mixed bag that weekend, Um, but in... Again, similar to what we saw in Montreal, even though in qualifying in Montreal it was still dry, in cooler conditions, Mercedes you know, delivered this just spectacular pace in qualifying. And even with the on and off rain in the race at Silverstone, the pace was still strong. And obviously, Lewis Hamilton delivered a brilliant drive that day to grab a famous victory at Silverstone. Um, and then obviously Hungary, they were able to get on the podium once again. Spain, obviously, a couple races before that, they were on the podium. How can I forget George Russell winning the Austrian Grand Prix? Not a win that he you know, deserved, but he got because obviously Max Verstappen and Lando Norris <coughs> had their accident. Um, and then the last Grand Prix before the summer break... On track was a Mercedes 1-2. Uh, George Russell sadly got disqualified, even though 
you know, uh, you know what he got disqualified for was fair enough. If your car's underweight, it's underweight. But if you look into the actual details of, you know, the the lap time gain he would have had per lap, with the advantage of being as underweight as he was, it wasn't anywhere near as big of an advantage to the point where you can, you know, completely dismiss the quality of Russell's drive. Maybe you could argue he wouldn't have won. Uh, you know, if it hadn't been for that. But, you know, it was still a brilliant drive from Russell, nonetheless. But Lewis Hamilton also put in a top drive. Uh, obviously got the lead early in that race and led for, I think, the most laps in that race as well. And it was just a, a top race all round uh, from Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes on their end. And the only issue, yeah, was obviously the disqualification for Russell. But... Yeah, Mercedes at the moment, it's it, it's incredible. They've gone from being one of the be- uh, or the biggest disappointment, which is what they were in those first few races of the season, to being the most informed team in Formula 1. They've won three of the last four races, and as long as they keep getting strong enough qualifying results, who knows if it will slow down. It's just, again, it's incredible to me how it it has turned around. But it is also clear to me how, uh, or the number one reason um, why it has turned around. And that is James Allison. Since he returned to the team, obviously, you know, the start of the season was a bad start. I don't think necessarily um, he had uh, total control over the um, 2024 car project because you know when he joined uh or rejoined mercedes uh when he did um you know i think which i think was was it april last year i think it was i believe it was um yeah mercedes already would have been probably you know uh planning out their 2024 car and all of that with their old uh technical director i think it was mike elliott um, so I don't think we can pin in, you know, 100% of the blame on Allison for the way the car turned out at the start of 2024, but we can absolutely credit him for the improvement since then. Um, and I just can't believe they ever got rid of the guy in favour of Mike Elliott because, I mean, James Allison has always been one of the top designers in Formula 1 and there was no reason, I don't think, to, to put him on the back burner like they did to go in favour with, with, with someone else because, you know, he was, uh, Allison responsible for the brilliant design of so many great Mercedes cars and that's really what they were missing in this new era and thankfully they finally found whatever formula that does work for them and that's why Mercedes are back in business. They're not going to win the championship, they're too far behind on the constructors end and on the driver's end, I mean, it, it would be quite incredible if, you know, Lewis Hamilton, for example, won the driver's championship. He would have to put in an incredible second half of the season. Um, yeah, he, he would have to win, uh, you know, with the amount of races we've got left, which I think is like 10. He'd have to win probably seven or eight of them to have a chance of winning the championship. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that is quite going to happen. But... Mercedes are here to play, no doubt about it, and they will continue picking up race wins and will still have an effect on how things play out on the Constructors and maybe even Drivers' Championship, given their performance level. Um, So those are the front-running teams. Let's uh, just whiz through the midfield teams because... There isn't a ton to say necessarily about all the midfield teams. Uh, Aston Martin, we've said enough about Aston Martin, I think, at this point. Um, We know their issues. Can't upgrade to save their lives. The fundamental car is good enough uh, for them to be easily faster than the rest of the midfield. And probably not that far behind, you know, the front running teams, but... You know, if we compare where they were at the start of the year, where, I mean, if you look at Fernando Alonso, he was racing regularly the two Mercedes cars. And now look, he is finishing, you know, almost a minute behind the Mercedes cars 
in the races and that just shows you the improvement Mercedes have made compared to Aston Martin who Aston Martin made the same improvement who knows what Fernando Alonso and Aston Martin would be doing but yeah Aston Martin they're gonna finish fifth in the championship but I mean until they figure out this whatever issue it is correlation issue from the wind tunnel to the track or whatever it is that you know it is costing them through a season then they are never going to be championship contenders in the future. No matter how high their ambition, they will never be championship contenders as long as this upgrade um, issue continues. Because you cannot go the whole way through a season without improving your car. It's impossible. Even, I think technically even Braun back in 2009, who had a very small budget were still able, with at least one upgrade, to improve their car enough to win the championship. And of course, you know, they did have the advantage of starting the year with the best car. But even them, with the small budget they had, were able to improve enough with one upgrade to still hang on and win the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship. So, surely... With all the money and resources there and the talent there, there's plenty of talented people there, surely they can fix this issue. I, 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 I don't want to be sat here this time next year talking about the same thing, put it that way. Uh, Racing Bulls, I think they've had a good season so far. I mean, we have to remember this time last year, they were last in the championship and were looking like they were not really going to improve on being last in the championship. But yeah, now they're in a much uh, more competitive position. The car is regularly a lot more competitive. Um, two drivers have performed well this season as well, Sonoda and Ricardo. Sonoda, I'd say more so than Ricardo. But um, yeah, I think Racing Bulls have had a, a good season. Maybe at certain races have been a bit underwhelming and you could have argued they could have done better. But I think realistically this season, I think sixth in the championship is where they need to aim for. I don't think they've got enough... Uh, there, unfortunately, to beat Aston Martin. Aston Martin, um, I think, probably still have enough with what they've got to end up beating them. Uh, so, yeah, Racing Bulls, still looking good. Haas in seventh. Haas, I think, have had a pretty good season. Obviously, started the uh, year with new team principal and started the year with consistently a much better car over all types of conditions really whether it be qualifying conditions or race conditions and for the first time in years this is the first year where Haas are able to at least match the pace they do in qualifying because that's been the biggest issue for them we saw last year multiple times got into the top 10 but weren't able to score points because they couldn't manage their tires for shit and would em uh, end up, you know, 14th, 15th, or wherever by the end of the race. This year is different. They've done a lot of work on that to fix that issue. And I think mostly have fixed that issue. And that's why they are 7th in the championship. And after the big upgrade they had, uh, about, I think back at Silverstone, I think Haas, I think they could maybe finish 6th in the championship. It's going to be difficult. Because I think Racing Bulls have got a better driver lineup, and I think Racing Bulls also, I think fundamentally, have probably got a better car than Haas do. Um, from say, you know, especially the higher aero tracks remaining on the calendar. But they're only six points behind, so it is possible they're in that fight, and that's what matters at the moment. And if they were to finish in sixth. That would be a fantastic season for them. But yeah, good season so far. Hope they keep up the good form. Uh, Alpine 8th in the championship. Disastrous start to the season. We all know what the issues were. They were, you know, uh, not enough downforce, but also way too overweight with their car. Uh, reliability also has been a massive issue uh, with them. They've had way too many... Um, you know, reliability incidents in races. <coughs> but also have had, you know, they've had reliability uh, incidents in races that have resulted in DNFs, but also reliability incidents that have not 
resulted in DNFs, which have meant that one of their drivers' races have ended up then being absolutely destroyed. So that's been a big issue for them this season as well. Along with, of course, the lack of power that the Renault power unit does have. They're still giving away uh, probably a couple tenths of a second per lap to, say, the Ferrari or Red Bull powertrain uh, power unit, which really does uh, hurt them at those faster racetracks. Um, but, I mean, they've improved the car a lot. We have seen some good performances this year. Obviously, Monaco was a good one for them. Uh, the Spanish Grand Prix was a very good performance by them. Probably the best race they've had this season. Austria was strong to a certain extent. Obviously, they just came, up, uh, came off of a good one at Spa with Ocon finishing in ninth, almost finishing in eighth ahead of Alonso, who did a one-stop strategy. Um, but... It, it's too few and far between, unfortunately, for Alpine. They could probably climb the Constructors' Championship, but what they need is consistent top 10 results, which is what they're missing. If they can consistently finish ninth, say, um, you know, in the next however many, you know, six or seven races coming up, that could probably put them in good stead, maybe, to climb up to 7th and maybe get into the fight even for 6th in the championship. Because, you know, with the top four teams being so competitive, you've only got, really, two or three positions for points there in the midfield. So, you know, it's really, in terms of who is going to win that battle in the midfield, it's all about consistency. At this point, given how um, small a window there is to actually score points. So, if, you know, if they could just improve on that consistency, then I think they can improve on their championship position. But I will admit that I would not be surprised if they did end up um, eighth in the championship because... You know, Haas and Racing Bulls do also have a pretty good car and good driver lineups as well. So, not going to be easy to improve on where they're at. Williams in ninth, um, they have not really been... Um, uh, they, they've been disappointing for me. You know, compared to last season, where there was a few races where they were really surprising us. They were even fighting with Aston Martins, Alpines... Uh, Ferraris even, if you remember back to Silverstone last year, there was, you know, the odd race where they would have just, you know, some incredible pace. This year, though, they've, they've just not really had that, and the reason is, is because, obviously, last year, they had a very slippery car in a straight line, which helped them a lot at, you know, power tracks or just high-speed tracks. This year, they've kind of gone a different direction and have gone for a car that is, uh, say, a lot more draggy. And I think, in general, does have a lot more downforce. But I don't think it's actually made for a better car, if that makes sense. Uh, maybe in terms of the handling it has, but the actual raw performance isn't... It's not as there as much as it was. So, yeah. I just think they've been a bit disappointing this year. And I think also have been relying heavily again on Alexander Albon to be as great as he is in those um you know midfield battles uh during 2024 to be able to you know score even the few points they have and they've only got four points for this year which is I think quite a bit lower than what they had this time last year so yeah disappointing season so far for Williams also haven't like the last couple of years, they've not had that big upgrade that's really changed their season. If you look at 2022 and 2023, in both of those years, they had a big upgrade mid-season, which took them from, say, you know, near the bottom of the midfield to being right in the mix. And they just haven't had that upgrade in 2024. So that's really cost them this season but they'll still have chances to score points but I don't see them finishing any higher than ninth and as long as they finish higher than Sauber in 10th then you know uh, I guess that's an okay season for them 
we have to remember Sterling with Williams, you know, finances and resources are still quite small for them compared to a lot of the grid. Uh, and for Sauber, terrible season. Carr has not improved at all on what we've seen last season. Um, I mean, even last season, we would see with the Sauber, you know, at high downforce tracks, some, you know, uh, extra performance from them. If you remember Hungary last year, they, you know, were, I think locked out the third row of the grid. Even this year, even at high downforce tracks, we don't really see extra performance from them. They're always, they're never shit enough to be like back row of the grid and, you know, miles off the pace. But they're never good enough to be actually fighting to be in the top 10. Um, and that's why they have zero points, exactly for that reason. Um, both drivers have been pretty mediocre. Valtteri Bottas clearly has been better than Joe Guan Yu this season, which we'll get onto later with uh, the driver rankings, but also we'll go through the uh, qualifying head-to-heads on screen for the teams. Um, but yeah, Sauber have just been pretty mediocre that's really why they finished last they've not been you know it's not a williams 2019 situation where they've been especially shit and that's why they're last they're just not strong enough in any area to finish in the points but they're not bad enough in in any area to be like like a williams 2019 where they're hilariously off the pace and they are the joke of the grid so yeah that's why salva are in 10th, but uh, yeah, we've gone pretty long there, I have to say, with the review of the teams, 45 minutes or so, um, and we've still got a couple things to get into. The next bit, though, should be a bit shorter than what we've just gone through, and it's going to be, uh, before we get onto the driver rankings, let's get on to the top five races of 2024. Now, in no particular order, the races I have nominated for my top five is Canada, Silverstone, Spa, Austria, and Miami. Now, Miami, the only reason I put Miami in is because I couldn't think of any other race. Again, you know, the competitiveness has improved this season, but we still have had a lot of boring races this year. Monaco, for example, was, I think, the worst race of all time. It was genuinely a horror show, how bad that race was. Um... But Miami, I think the only reason you could probably put that in is because, yeah, we did get some decent racing. But, I mean, you know, obviously the Lando Norris win. Um, so I'd put that in at fifth in that top five. Um, again, I couldn't think of any other race to put in there. So that's why I put the Miami one there. So I'd put, yeah, Miami in fifth. Fourth best, I would go, um, I think, Spa fourth best because even though yeah it was a slow burn race and it did get better towards the end we still we didn't get a proper on track battle at the end which is what we were needing um to make it like a proper classic finish to the belgian grand prix and that's why i'm gonna put it below the Austrian Grand Prix, which up until that final 20 laps was a pretty bad race. Um, there was nothing really going on in the Austrian Grand Prix. There were some battles in the midfield, but it was nothing that special. But then after that final pit stop for Max and Lando, it just exploded into life. Obviously, Max and Lando going head to head. Lando trying to overtake a million times and failing. Then they made contact and all of that happened. Uh, we had also Piastri doing an incredible move on Carlos Sainz. I think round the outside at turn six. And then a very uh, nail-biting finish to see you know who would win the race between Russell and Piastri. Russell, of course, ended up taking it. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I'd put Austria third. Because that final 20 laps, it, it was very exciting. There is no doubt about that but clearly the best two races of the year Canada and Silverstone but who would I go for number one I think number two out of those two would have to be Canada and even though the Canadian Grand Prix it was great it was very unpredictable 
the driving, the quality of the driving in that race was fantastic, given how, you know, the track condition was so poor at times, and was obviously changing around all the time. That final 20 laps, even though we did get some overtaking and drama, it did drop off in entertainment and drama. And also, I think in that final 20 laps, once obviously Max Verstappen got into the lead, and then you had Norris, Russell, Hamilton, Piastri all fighting for second, third, fourth, fifth, we knew at that point that Max was going to win the race, so it kind of took away that um, that drama of, you know, who was going to win the race. And that's really why the British Grand Prix at Silverstone is my best race of the season. Because, and I'm still mad that I wasn't able to do the race watch along that day, because that race was incredible. From lap one until probably the penultimate lap, you did not know what was going to happen and who was going to win. You had Russell in the lead, Hamilton, Norris... You had Piastri right there looking like he you know, was going to fight for the win. Obviously, Verstappen at the end was closing in quick. It was just brilliant. And the, the weather is what we have to thank for that. The, the brilliant British weather in the summer. On and off rain every, what was it, like five minutes or so. Causing that race to be just so dramatic. Um, brilliant overtaking, brilliant drama. And yeah, that British Grand Prix, especially with the ending we've got, uh, we got for that race with Lewis Hamilton, obviously the the king of Silverstone, taking his first win in Formula One at the time for what was it, two and a half years. It was the perfect conclusion to uh, you know a, pretty much a perfect Grand Prix. It was absolutely fantastic. So uh, <clears throat> yeah. I'd have to say British Grand Prix, the best. But let me know in the comments section, do you think the British Grand Prix was the best race of the season? Was it the Canadian Grand Prix or was it some other race? If you want to give me your top five best races of the season in order, you know, let me know in the comments section below and I will make sure to have a look and uh, you know maybe comment on a couple that I see. Um, but yeah, I think... For me, the the clear two best races of the year is Silverstone and Montreal. I'd be very surprised if anyone went with any different race for their top two. Because for me, those are the two clear best races. Those two races were classic races that you'll go back in years' time and watch again. When a couple of those other races, you, I mean, maybe you'll watch back next year. But I'm not sure in five years' time you'll even remember necessarily what happened but um yeah that british grand prix what a race and still gutted that i missed out on it live at the time <clears throat> but yeah unfortunately illness struck me down at the absolute wrong time but let's get into now the main event of this mid-season review and it is the driver rankings for 2024 so far like I said, I am going to go from 21st all the way to 1st. I'm sure I will cause some controversy. I will try to justify in the best way I can my rankings as I go through. And I will admit that for the top 6 drivers, it was very difficult to uh, place people in certain positions. Because it was very close between certain drivers... And um, it, it took a lot of thinking as to who I think deserved to be higher than whoever. So, yeah, uh, we'll get into that a bit later. But let's start at the very back. The, the, the drivers at the back, it wasn't really that hard to decide. 21st, Logan Sargent. Another terrible season. Um, he has been lately a bit closer on lap time to Alban, but still puts in just terrible race performances and is just in general nowhere near the action uh deservedly is getting dropped from the williams team which i will just quickly get on to uh now because of course that was announced a couple of days ago great uh decision by williams to sign carlos Sainz. massive improvement for their team and carlos Sainz and alex albert at williams that you could argue is now the best driver lineup um in the midfield carlos obviously a race winner um, you know, he's won, what, three Grand Prix, Alex Albon, one of the top midfield performers, 
that's a great driver lineup for Williams. And with that lineup, if they can improve the car next year back to the level it was at last year, there's no reason why Williams can't be a contender for sixth, seventh in the championship, say next season or even moving forward, you know, into the future. Um, See so yeah, a brilliant signing by Williams. But Logan Sargent deserved to go because he's still been absolutely horrendous this year. Uh, 20th, Zhou Guan Yu. Uh, not only have Sauber been terrible, but like I said, their two drivers have been terrible. And Zhou has been regularly awful. Eliminated in Q1 so many times, even though his teammate Valtteri Bottas has, you know, still been able a fair few times to get through to the second part of qualifying. Zhou Guan Yu has not been able to. And most importantly, if we look at the head-to-head, -head, uh, qualifying head-to-head -head of Bottas and Zhou... Valtteri Bottas has absolutely slaughtered Zhou this year, which is why Zhou, I'm hoping, will not be on the grid next year because he does not deserve to be on the grid next year. He is not a good enough driver for Formula One when you consider some of the talent off the grid right now. Um, so yeah, Zhou Guan Yu, absolutely terrible. And uh, yeah, this uh, last 10 races or so of the season... Should be his last in Formula 1. Just ahead of him though, Valtteri Bottas in 19th. Even though Bottas has destroyed Joe this year, I think he's also been pretty poor. Um, it's not really delivered in the races. That's why officially he's 21st in the championship. Because even with some decent qualifying results he's had in a poor Sauber car, he just hasn't really been in there in the races. Also still regularly has bad starts. And it's just not a feature at all in the midfield. And even though it looks like maybe Bottas will be on the grid next year for Sauber, I wouldn't be surprised if he was not on the grid next year in Formula 1, you know, in general. Because even though he's been better than Joe, that's not exactly an accomplishment. He's also been, I think, pretty poor himself. 18th, we're going to go Oliver Behrman. Of course, only did one race in Formula 1 in Saudi Arabia, but that race of his, the, I think, 7th place finish it was in Saudi, that result and drive alone was more impressive than what Bottas, Joe, or Sargent have done all season long. Cannot wait to see Behrman in Formula 1. Not had the greatest F2 season, but we know he's super talented, and I think he'll do well in Formula 1, uh, another very talented British driver coming to the grid very, very soon from the Ferrari Driver Academy. Next up, Sergio Perez, 17th best driver this year. I couldn't put him any lower than 17th because, I mean, we have to remember with Perez, the first, what was it, four or five races of the year, he did perform well enough. Like, he was up on the podium, finished second, I think, three times in the first five races, I think it was. So, you know, we can't say that Perez has been awful in every single race, because that's not true. Um, but that's the only reason I can put him ahead of Behrman, Bottas, Joe, and Sargent. The rest of his season, given the car he's in, has been absolutely abysmal. He, it, you know, if he is not on the grid next year, he cannot complain. He has only himself to blame for his own you know, for, for the results because it's his own fault. A lot of his results is him overdriving and making really silly mistakes, especially in like Q1 where pressure really isn't on for him to you know deliver like a super quick lap. Um, you know, we saw that especially at Silverstone and in Hungary. You know, we've seen plenty of races where he's been outperformed by the you know, racing bull drivers that are rumoured to replace him. Obviously, they're not going to now replace him at Red Bull. I, 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 I don't think I can really reach for any more words to describe how bad Sergio Perez's season has been. But that was the highest I could put him. I couldn't put him any higher than that. Um, I was never going to put him absolutely last because I don't think he's been like, you know, I don't think he's been worse than Logan Sargent or Joe Guan Yu. He's not been that bad. But yeah, 17th is the absolute best I could, I, I could put him. Uh, just shockingly bad season from Sergio Perez. 
Um, 16th, I've gone Kevin Magnussen. Very similar year to last year, not delivering enough in qualifying, and that's why um, he's not scored that many points compared to teammate Hulkenberg. Has had a couple, I think, better races lately, but it's still not enough. He's, it's not consistent enough, and that's why Kevin Magnussen is not going to be on the grid next year, and is now, uh, you know, he's, he's got his final few races left now of his Formula 1 career, because the consistency of speed that was there before is not there anymore um i'm not sure if it went with you know the year that he took off in 2021 but yeah it's not there anymore unfortunately for k mag um and that's why yeah 16th on the grid a uh, 16th best on the grid that's that, that that was the best i could go for no way i could put him any higher than that and then the next two drivers i've got here is the two Alpine drivers, and obviously it's going to be Gasly in 15th, and then Ocon 14th. Ocon, the reason ahead of Gasly is because he's been better this year. The head-to-head -head, uh, clearly showcases that. Ocon has been uh, quite dominant over Gasly this year, which has been impressive, even though he's been booted out of the team, obviously, for next year for uh, alternate reasons other than, you know, his own performance level. Um, yeah, Alpine, the, the drivers, they've had, I wouldn't say they've had bad seasons, but they've not had good enough seasons to be talked about as like, um, you know, like very good performers this year, um, in that midfield. They've been, I would say, above average at best, but there's no way I could put them up there with, you know, your, your Hulkenbergs, Sonodas, uh, even Ricardos in the midfield because it's not consistent enough like i was saying earlier with alpine they'll have the odd good race but then they'll have maybe two or three races where they're just not really on the pace and not really doing anything and that isn't enough really for me to put the alpine drivers any higher so yeah 14th and 15th for them with ocon ahead of gasly 13th i've got alexander alban can't put him any higher because in terms of comparing him to the Aston Martin drivers, uh, Hulkenberg and the Racing Bulls drivers, uh, the Williams car just hasn't been competitive enough to really be, I guess, um, comparable in terms of, you know, Albon as a driver compared to those drivers. Uh, Albon, yeah, he's had... Some good performances this year, but it's not been in that car. You know, he just hasn't had enough of them, I think, to be mixing it with, yes, yeah, Sonoda, Hulkenberg, drivers like that in that midfield pack in terms of, you know, these driver rankings. But I think he's had a mostly good season. I think what he needs is just a better car, and then maybe I would rank him higher. But from what we've seen this year... It's not been enough to put him, you know, up in the top 10 or anything like that. He's not been maybe as impressive as last year. But again, if you've not got as good of a car, then you're not going to shine as much, um, you know, as he did last season. So that's why I've got him in 13th. 12th, I've got Lance Stroll. Obviously, last year, I remember ranking Stroll very low. But that was different last year because Aston Martin had a much better car last year compared to what they've got this year. Um, yeah, with Stroll, I've got him in 12th. Um, the reason I've not got him any lower is because, again, it's hard really with Stroll and Albon, it's hard to compare those two fairly because the Aston Martin car is so much quicker than the Williams car in you know, most uh, race weekends. And we have to remember with Stroll, he has had a couple races lately where he's been quicker and ahead of Fernando Alonso. And as much as maybe we don't like Stroll, we have to give him credit for that. Um, so that's really why I've got Stroll there ahead of Albon. But the reason I haven't got him any higher is because still, in that Aston Martin car, given that it's fifth in the championship, and it's been, again, most of the time the best midfield car, with him... You know, where he's in the championship, 10th and only a couple points ahead of Sonoda and Hulkenberg, and only, I think, 10 points or 12 ahead of Ricardo. I still feel as though he should be doing more in 
uh, that car and be more consistent, which is why I've got him in P12. Uh, P11, I've got Daniel Ricciardo. Didn't start the season well, but I'd say... I'd say probably since Miami, where he had that really strong, I think, sprint race, he's been more consistently putting in the results that I think are good enough for that team. We're still not seeing, obviously, you know, prime Daniel Ricciardo from, like, 2014 or 2016. I don't think that Daniel Ricciardo necessarily uh, exists anymore, but... I think he's been... I do think he's been better than Stroll. Because, like I said, I think the Racing Bulls car, um, you know, is still a bit slower than the Aston Martin car. But Ricardo, you know, despite that, is still uh, around 10 points behind Stroll in the championship. Um, and lately, you know, in the last, what, six, seven races, Ricardo compared to Sonoda, who's been a top midfield performer for me, Ricardo has been, you know... Uh, regularly fighting with and occasionally beating Sonoda and we can't deny that so yeah Ricardo I would say has had a a good season but it definitely could be better just needs more consistency uh like Sonoda I think Sonoda I think that's really what he has over Ricardo is that consistency if Ricardo can just improve on that then maybe by the end of the year I'll put Ricardo in my top ten. But yeah, I think he's had a I think he's had a good season given the car he's been driving. Um then in tenth place I have gone Nico Hulkenberg. Another good season for the Hulk, who of course is leaving the uh Haas F one team at the end of the year, going to Sauber, who of course will be Audi in twenty twenty six. Um, yeah, I think this season, in general, most of the time, I think he's done the best he can for that team. Got the most out of the car. Um, had two really strong results in Austria and Silverstone, two uh, sixth place finishes, which have massively helped the Haas team of the championship. But he's still their go-to man, um, it, it, you know, for the team. And he is, you know, currently only a couple points behind Stroll in the championship and still... Only, I think, 20, what is it, like 27 or 28 points behind Fernando Alonso, which I think is very impressive because, again, in the Constructors' Championship, the gap is a lot bigger between those two teams. And this season, the Aston Martin car has been regularly a lot quicker than the Haas. So for Hulkenberg to be that close, I think is a, I think is a really good effort. So yeah, I've gone uh, Hulkenberg in P10. Just ahead in P9, Yuki Sonoda, who I think has had yet again a very good season. Uh, obviously has been better than Ricardo. I think we can uh, agree on that, most of us, uh, for this season at Racing Bulls. I would say better than Hulkenberg simply because I think he's been more consistent in being up in that top 10 fighting for points and that. And I think he's been giving Aston Martin probably more trouble than Hulkenberg has. Um, and yes, yeah, Sonoda, I think, thoroughly deserves to be up in there uh, in the top 10 driver rankings in ninth place. It is such a shame that he's not under consideration at Red Bull. Because if he was, I think, I, I think I might have even said it a couple of races ago. If he was under consideration, I think he already would have got the drive. Because... He's better than Ricardo at the minute, performance-wise. He's better than Perez. We've seen that for the last year. You know, w w what is stopping them at this point? But we know what is stopping them. That he he's not their guy. He, they they don't consider him an option because you know the reason he's at that team in the first place is I think because of Honda, not because of Red Bull, which is sad. But that's the way things are in Formula One, unfortunately. And then out of the midfield, uh, the best driver, the eighth best driver overall for the entire grid, I think for this year, Fernando Alonso. Uh, and yes, lately hasn't been too great. It's been very stroppy and miserable. Did put in a great drive, though, at Spa on a one-stop strategy to finish in eighth place. But I think if you go and look back at the first seven races of the year, I think that's really why... I've got Fernando 8th best for the year so far. Because in that part of the season, I think he was performing brilliantly. Um, he was mixing it with the front runners. 
He was, I mean, was it uh, the Chinese Grand Prix? He was battling with the front runners um, and fighting for some really, you know, good positions, good points, and dragging that Aston Martin car into positions that you probably could argue didn't quite deserve to be in and did the best he could. Um, the reason, <laughs> you know, he's been miserable as of late is because that car obviously has gone nowhere in terms of improvement and that's why he is so miserable and I think has every right to be miserable because Aston Martin have let him down. They've let both drivers down, to be honest, uh, but especially him who started the year in really, really fine form. Um, but yeah, Fernando, I still think, has been a top performer this year. So, eighth best for me. But let's now get into your top seven, where things really get interesting. So, seventh best driver. This was a pretty easy choice for me, but Carlos Sainz. I know he's won a race, and he has been consistent this year. You know, he's had a, a couple podiums. Um, he's been a you know consistent point scorer. But despite that race win, he just hasn't been spectacular enough for me to put him ahead of, you know, Max or the two Mercedes or the two McLaren drivers or his teammate. I mean, there's no way I could put, put him ahead of his teammate because Leclerc has been better this season. There's no doubt about that. The head-to-heads prove it. Um, obviously, you know, we, we can see the championship standings as well. But I think we, you know, most of us agree Leclerc has been better than Carlos Sainz. Um, and that's why I've got Sainz, um, seventh best driver for the year. Because whilst he's been consistent and good, he hasn't been as good for me at, at, at all as the top six, who have been just that bit better and more spectacular than him. Sixth best, and this may upset a couple of uh, people in the uh, comments, or a couple of people uh, listening, but Oscar Piastri is who I'm going for in sixth. Now, the reason I haven't put him any higher is because, one, can't put him ahead of Lando, because Lando has been better than him this season. I mean, you know, when you look at the head-to-heads, you can't, I don't think you can fairly put Oscar ahead of Lando for, for this season. Yeah, lately, You could say last three or four races, maybe Oscar's been the better driver. But overall, for the season so far, remember that, we're ranking them based on the season so far, not just the last three or four races. Lando has been better than him. So, you know, can't put him ahead of Lando. And given that, really, his season on a consistent basis has only picked up in the last, say, four or five races... I just can't put him any higher than, you know, than sixth. Because if you go and look at those first seven or eight races, he had a couple decent results in, uh, what was it, Saudi Arabia. He had a decent result. Obviously, Australia finished in fourth behind his teammate. Um, There was an unlucky race he had in Miami where he got damage from Carlos Sainz, I think it was. Obviously, had second place in Monaco. But other than that, in that first eight, nine, even ten races, you know, those properly good results were minimal for Piastri. And like I said, it's not really been until these last three or four races where Oscar has consistently started to contend, along with his teammate, with the front runners and fight for podiums and race wins on a regular basis. That's why I've got him in sixth place. If he had had a much better start to the year where he had been a lot closer to Lando, maybe ahead of Lando, then I probably could have put him a position or two higher. But because he didn't start the season that well, I I can't put him any higher than sixth, unfortunately. But even though he's sixth for now, that doesn't mean he's going to finish there. I could easily see him climbing up at least one position before the end of the year. Maybe a couple. Depends on, obviously, you know, uh, if he wins any more races. Of course, that would massively help his effort. Uh, But yeah, Oscar Piastri has had a good season so far. But the form he's shown as of late, he needs to keep up for the rest of the season. 
he can't afford to drop back into the form he had at the start of the year. Obviously, I know the McLaren wasn't as good at the start of the year, but just in general, like, you know, where he was at compared to Lando, even at the start of the year, he can't afford to drop back into that type of form. If he keeps up the form he's got at the minute, then he will have a very good second half of the season. I have no doubt about that. Uh, fifth best, I am going for Charles Leclerc, who, of course, has taken a race win this year, broken the Monaco curse, even though it may have cursed him for the rest of the season, maybe his team for the rest of the year. Um, but really, the reason I've got Leclerc ahead of Piastri is because in those first eight races of the year, Leclerc was regularly on the podium and contending in the top three and obviously won the Monaco Grand Prix. Obviously, since the Canadian Grand Prix, Ferrari's pace has dropped off. Leclerc hasn't performed as well since then, which is why he's dropped to fifth in my driver rankings. When if, you know, you asked me after the Monaco Grand Prix, I probably would have had Leclerc at least in third. Um, Yeah, the reason he's dropped down to fifth is because he hasn't driven as well since Monaco. Um, He's had a couple races which have been a bit shoddy and he's been a bit all over the place. Last couple weekends, though, have been good. Uh, Fourth in Hungary, third at Spa. I thought Spa, I thought he had a a really great weekend. Um, More of that, please, from Leclerc. But I can't put him any higher because, like I said, since that Monaco win, it just hasn't been consistently good enough. If he had been a bit more consistent, maybe I would have him a position higher than he's uh, you know, than he is in these rankings. But like I said, he's just been a bit, you know, hit and miss at times since that Monaco win. But still performing at a very high level and is still clearly Ferrari's man. Fourth best driver, Lewis Hamilton, and that may cause uh controversy um so number one the reason i've got him behind george russell is clear because george russell has been better this season the head-to-head qualifying head-to-head really does um you know i i think prove that but also if we look at the or if you know you saw the championship standings earlier lewis hamilton Indeed, he is ahead in the championship by, uh, what is it, 34 points, I think it is, ahead of Russell. But Russell, of course, has had that disqualification and he did have that retirement at Silverstone, which cost him a fair few points as well. If you, you know, let's say with Russell, you you know don't give him back all the points he, uh, you know, lost at Spa, but let's say you add on um, 10 or 12 points at Spa and then, you know, uh, 12 points at Silverstone. That's like a race wins worth of points that, um, you know, that that, that Russell's lost through issues that haven't been anything to do with him. And I still maintain when it comes to the disqualification at Spa, you know, the decision (coughs) to disqualify him was the right decision, no doubt about that, but the amount of time he gained per lap by being as underweight as he was, was not enough to completely diminish the drive he put in, and I will challenge anyone on that, Um, and then like I said, at Silverstone, was running in fourth, maybe even ended up on the podium that day, had it not been for his retirement, who knows what he would have done in the final stint of the race, but then obviously had his DNF. So I think that skews things in the Drivers' Championship. And that's why, firstly, I've got Lewis Hamilton below um, George Russell in the Drivers' Championship. But the reason, um, uh, not the Drivers' Championship, but you know my uh, team rank, uh, my driver rankings here. But the reason I've got Lewis also below Lando Norris is because... In the first seven or eight races of the year, Lewis's performance level wasn't good enough. And yes, we know why. The car wasn't good enough. He didn't like the setup of the car. 
the handling, all of that. You know, that's fair enough. But at the end of the day, his performance level in those first few races of the year was not strong enough for me to have him, you know, ahead of Lando overall for 2024 so far. At the minute, if we're basing... Uh, these driver rankings on the last four races, absolutely, I would put Lewis Hamilton ahead of Lando Norris, but we're not basing it on the last four races. We're basing it on the 14 races so far. And based on the 14 races so far, George Russell has been better. Qualifying proves that. And again, when you add in some uh, context there for the championship standings, I think a lot of reasonable people would agree that Russell has been better. Uh, and for Lando Norris, I think he's been more consistent, especially at the front of the field. So that's why I've got Lewis Hamilton fourth. But if Hamilton keeps up this current form, there's no reason why he can't end up in third, second, or even as the best driver of the year. So if he keeps it up, We'll see what happens. But yeah, I, I, I can't put him any higher than fourth. Because, like I said, in those first few races of the year, and, you know, the biggest Lewis Hamilton fans in the world, I'm sure they'll argue it until they're blue in the face, but you cannot tell me that Lewis Hamilton's performance level in those first few races was good enough. Because it was not. Let's not pretend like Lewis has got the absolute best out of the car at every race weekend, because he hasn't. And, you know, with George Russell, not necessarily has he got the best out of the car every weekend, but I think more so he has. So that's why I've got Hamilton fourth best driver of the year. Third best driver, Lando Norris. Which really is lower than it should be. Because a few races ago, I said on stream that Lando and Max, not in that order, but that those two were the two best drivers on the planet. But I think so far for 2024, I don't think I would say Lando has been the second best driver this year. And really, it's because of these last few races which have hurt slightly his I think overall um uh, just my overall view of his season so far he has been fantastically consistent he's been on the po uh, podium multiple times regularly getting the best out of the car in qualifying up until these last few weeks where again Spain got pole lost two positions at the start cost him victory Austria yeah, he had contact with Max, but he had chances to overtake Max before then, didn't take it, and, you know, resulted in what it did. Silverstone, very poor qualifying effort, and then the race. I mean, he was he performed better in the race, but I don't think still it was a, a quite good enough race performance to, to, to win that. Um, Hungary, you could say, was a bit unlucky with the gearbox, uh, but still his... His race pace, I don't think, was good enough there um, compared to Piastri to really be thought of as a, a a race win contender for that race, which is why, fairly, McLaren, you know, had Lando swap things around. And then at the race we've just been at, at Spa, Lando, uh, yeah, put in a stinker, putting a wheel in the gravel and being pretty much nowhere compared to his teammate, during the race itself. So that's really why I've got Lando in third. But you know, if he had delivered, you know, if he had won the British Grand Prix and say the Spanish Grand Prix, I'd probably have him at least second and maybe even a close second behind, you know, the person I've got in first place, which I think you guys could probably guess who that person is. But again, these last few weeks, he just hasn't quite delivered what has been capable in that car. When if you look at the first nine races of the year, I think 90% of the time you could say, you know what, Lando has got the most out of the car. You can't ask any more of him. He's done the job he's you know been hired to do. But again, these last three, four races, 
I'm not sure you can necessarily say that. And that's why I've got him third in this driver ranking. And second is the man who was disqualified in Spa, George Russell, who I think has had an absolutely brilliant season. Like I showed earlier with the head-to-head with Lewis Hamilton, he's been better than Hamilton this year. Um, and, and I think as well, not only have his qualifying performances this year been great, that pole position lap, by the way, he had at Silverstone was just incredible. Canada as well, brilliant effort there to get on pole by, well, no amount of lap time. Um, but his race performances as well have been absolutely brilliant. And I think if you look at the season so far, there's maybe only a couple races where you could say Russell didn't get maybe the most out of the car that he could have got. Every other weekend, he's been bagging it. He's been getting the absolute maximum from the car and been keeping it, um, you know, in respectable uh, positions. Um, You know, and, you know, in comparison to Lewis Hamilton, as I said earlier, Russell in those first, those early races was much better than Lewis Hamilton. But since the car has improved, even though Lewis Hamilton's own performance has improved, Russell's own performance level has also improved. Um, you know, still uh, been at a very good level. Uh, again, the performance across the Canadian Grand Prix weekend was brilliant. Did win in Austria, even though it was not um, a deserved win, but he was on for a podium and it was a very consistent, good performance the whole weekend. And like I said, Silverstone was unlucky, probably maybe could have ended up with a podium that weekend. And then Spa, the race we just came off, um, as I've said a million times, I, I don't think you can take away from what was a great performance. There was nothing Russell could do about the car being disqualified. It was a team error. He went for the best strategy, he thought, and pulled it off. But, you know, he didn't know that the car was in the state it was in. Uh, but again, when you look at, you know, the, 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 the gain per lap time he would have had from being as underweight as he was... As I said earlier, it wasn't enough to completely diminish the greatness of that performance. You could diminish it probably a bit, but not entirely. So, yeah. Second best driver of the year, George Russell. I know that will surprise people because, I mean, last year we were very critical of him. Making too many mistakes. Uh, A lot of races he was nowhere near Hamilton. Was uh, just not getting anywhere near the best out of the Mercedes car. This year has been different. This year has been a lot more back to what we saw in 2022, which is the level Russell has to perform at going forward if he's ever going to have a chance of winning a world championship in the future. But yeah, I think he has been, you know, when you compare him to Norris and Hamilton, I think he more, I think more so than Norris and Hamilton has got the most out of his car than the other two have. And that's why I have Russell in second place. And in first, of course, your championship leader, world champion, and probably uh, world champion elect, Max Verstappen. And we have to remember that, you know, at the start of the year when Red Bull had a dominant car, Max was faultless, was winning almost every race. Obviously, Australia didn't win because of a car failure. Miami, Norris ended up winning through very fortunate circumstances, let's be honest. Max would have won that race had it not been for that safety car coming out when it did. And Max also had damage to his car that we cannot forget. Um, And, you know, those first, yeah, seven, eight races of the year, Max was... Not entirely faultless, but, you know, was as good as you really possibly could be. Now, since then, you know, say since the Canadian Grand Prix, he hasn't performed as well, but still has performed at a pretty high level. His win in Canada, top win. The Red Bull car was not necessarily the best car that weekend in in any condition, but, you know, he was able to consistently keep himself up there in the fight and whilst others made mistakes he rose to the top 
in Spain, delivered when he absolutely had to at the start to pass Lando Norris and then pass George Russell on lap three. Austria, of course, had contact with Norris. Um, you know, whoever you blame for that is whoever you blame for that. Silverstone, I, th- I think Max, it wasn't one of his great performances, but I think Max still performed well, did well in qualifying to get fourth and not be that far off pole, despite having a damaged car. And then in the race, was only a couple seconds away from victory. Um, Hungary, yeah, wasn't a good performance in the race, but I think a lot of that was because of the team, not him. And then at Spa, unbelievable performance in qualifying, just whipping Efron's ass, really, in qualifying. And then in the race, did the best he could, finished in fourth. Car wasn't really set up for the race, so he couldn't really do any better than that. But yeah, I think Max, looking at this season, I think 80, maybe 85% at most of the time, has done the best he can. And when he's been at his best, it's been too good for the rest of of the field and that's why Max Verstappen is going to win the world championship this year but those are my driver rankings if you disagree let me know in the comments section I'm sure there'll be plenty of disagreements in the comments if you want to give me your list or just a top five or a top ten again post it in the comments and I'll have a look and review whatever arguments you guys have in disagreement of whatever uh, or, or you know of my list Uh, But yeah, that, guys, is it for my mid-season review. The next piece of content I've got uh, coming on the channel, I'm not going to quite confirm what it is yet, but I'm hoping to release it this time next week, next Friday night. Again, not going to confirm what it is, but I'm just hoping at least that I can get it out for when I just said um, I'm planning to get it out for. And if I can, then, of course, I'll reveal more on the day of the upload. But uh, thank you guys for coming on for this mid-season review. Again, make sure to let me know in the comments section what you thought of what I had to say about the season so far. And in general, let me know in the comments what you thought of the 2024 Formula 1 season so far. Of course, we'll be back racing in about three weeks' time for the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort. Cannot wait for it. But yeah, until my next piece of content, guys, which, uh, like I said, I hope to be next Friday night. For a video that I think you guys all uh, definitely want to have a say on. Until then guys, it's been me, Chazzer HD. Goodbye.